So uh, I uh, have to uh, make another announcement uh, regarding our uh, panel. First of all, I want to thank you, everybody who is uh, here. I uh, know that it's a long day, a lot of presentations, and so we really appreciate uh, your attendance. Um, if you look at the panel and if you look at the program, something seems different. Um, so I have to say, uh, this is not Ricardo Faglia. Uh, uh, unfortunately, he got stuck in Guatemala City uh, uh, with visa problems. Uh, we make it happen that he comes tomorrow. So we could uh, kind of uh, fix at least uh, that he will be here. So we had to switch uh, because we wanted to give him an opportunity to speak. So we switched and Heather was graciously uh, accepting to give her uh, a presentation now, which I, we are very grateful for. So uh, this is Heather. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, uh, I wanted to say uh, uh, hello to Douglas uh, uh, Carranza. He is from the Univers uh, Cal State uh, uh, Northridge and uh, will chair this panel when he gets the bios on his computer. <laughs> okay, and I think uh, here he is, Douglas Carranza. Okay, thank you. Um, I was trying to figure out how to deal with the internet, uh, pero ya pude. Este, mi nombre es Douglas Carranza, uh, soy profesor de la Universidad de Northridge, uh, soy el jefe del Departamento de Estudios Centroamericanos, uh, el único en los Estados Unidos, y eh, estoy muy contento por uh, estar en este en este import, en esta importante conferencia uh, yo creo que uh, hemos estado soy de El Salvador hemos estado haciendo esfuerzos enormes en, en esta ciudad de Los Ángeles por presentar una visión diferente de, de Centroamérica en las diferentes áreas sean estas las áreas solidarias durante la época de los 80 uh, Y ahora eh, en el área académica, es parte del proceso uh, que nos lleva a los centroamericanos a diferentes lugares. Uh, yo creo que los paneles están dando un poco de mayor claridad a algo que nosotros siempre hemos sostenido en Central American Studies, de que se necesita hacer mucho más para poder entender las dinámicas uh, que están pasando en, en la región centroamericana a nivel transnacional y aquí en los Estados Unidos, especialmente donde hay una población aproximada de 6 a 7 millones de centroamericanos. Y la población guatemalteca es una de las mayores. Eh, primero está la salvadoreña con 3 millones de habitantes de ahí este, uh, Guatemala, Guatemala que tendrá aproximadamente tal vez dos millones porque no se declara mucho sobre de dónde viene uno cuando pasan el censo por razones obvias que explicaron en el anterior panel del racismo y las cuestiones de terror ah, por las que uno pasa. Entonces ah, la diferencia y cuando oí el panel anterior eh, me parecía de que la comunidad guatemalteca, y es una de las preocupaciones que tenemos en nuestro departamento, no ha tenido la efectividad de proyectar la profundidad de lo que pasó allá en Guatemala y que sigue pasando. No ha tenido esa proyección como la hemos tenido nosotros los salvadoreños. Este, uh, en alguna medida por ese racismo profundo que existe eh, uh, y que la comunidad guatemalteca también no tiene esa unidad por, debido a ese racismo que existe, porque aún aquí en los Estados Unidos esa división cultural existe, lo podemos ver bien claramente, que eh, gran parte de la población ladina no interactúa con las comunidades uh, indígenas de Guatemala. 
Y eso es muy problemático cuando se trata de hacer denuncias efectivas sobre lo que pasa en, en Guatemala. Aquí yo creo que estamos a una milla o dos millas de donde está el centro fuerte de la comunidad maya, quiché, canjobal. Si fuéramos ahorita, iban a miles de, de eh, comuni miembros de la comunidad maya que deberían de estar aquí, pero no están. Este, uh, y yo creo que eso eh, viene a darle... Creo que es parte de la crítica que debemos de hacer nosotros, cómo en realidad estamos proyectando. Uh, quiero uh, agradecer de nuevo a, a los que nos han invitado a participar. Uh, con nosotros uh, se encuentran en esta ocasión el doctor uh, Ricardo Falla, no va a estar con nosotros como lo mencionaron. Uh, pero sí se encuentra Ana María Méndez Dardón, uh, de Canadá, bueno, no de Canadá, eh, de, eh, de Guatemala, pero viene de Canadá, sí, la historia transnacional. Eh, ella va a hablar sobre historia personal creciendo en la resistencia, es abogada, notaria y licenciada en ciencias jurídicas y sociales, de la Universidad de San Carlos de Guatemala y posgrado en Mujeres y Derechos Humanos de la Universidad de Chile, con distinción máxima, con formación académica y experiencia profesional en derechos humanos, justicia, penal y género, principalmente desde los centros de investigación y organizaciones no gubernamentales, como investigadora y docente para operadores de justicia docenta sobre género y desarrollo humano en el programa de las Naciones Unidas para el Desarrollo, asimismo funcionaria pública en instancias de administración de justicia penal y recientemente como experta analista en el sistema de justicia para casos de violencia contra las mujeres en la Comisión Nacional para el Seguimiento y Apoyo al Fortalecimiento de la Justicia Voluntaria en Amnesty International, Toronto, en la Red de Mujeres y a partir de septiembre inicia eh, la maestría en Ciencias Políticas en la Universidad de Webb, Canadá. Bienvenida y gracias por estar con nosotros. También tenemos a Heather Brana. Eh, ella es a uh, profesora de Southern Connecticut State University in New Haven. Uh, Brana is assistant professor of history at Southern Connecticut State University, uh, researches youth, social movements, urban stories, and class formation in modern Central America, with particular interest in how political culture and violence shape class formation. At the conference, uh, Brana will share her research on transnational justice and her ongoing collaboration with Guatemala branch of IJOS in English, Sons and Daughters of Identity and Justice Against Oblivion and Silence. Thank you, Brana, and welcome. Uh, también tenemos con nosotros a uh, Miguel Zamora Mills, International Relations de Guatemala, Resisting Impunity, Preserving Truth, Victim Participation, and Querellante Adhesivo, and the Rios Mont Trial. Uh, Miguel Zamora has worked for the past few years with the International Platform Against Impunity in Guatemala on issues related to the protection of human rights defenders, strengthening of the justice system, and the impact of business on indigenous rights. Previously, he has accompanied genocide survivors in the exil, exil region during the preparatory phase of the genocide, genocide case. Currently, Miguel is studying law at Columbia Law School where he focuses on international human rights and constitutional law. Welcome, all of you, and thank you for being here. Good 
Buenas tardes a todos y todas. Muchas gracias a la Fundación Shoah eh, por la invitación. Es un honor para mí poder compartir con ustedes eh, parte de mi experiencia personal creciendo en la resistencia en Guatemala. Eh, un especial agradecimiento a Victoria Sanford. Eh, te admiro mucho, Victoria, y muchas gracias por todo tu trabajo y compromiso por la lucha por la justicia en Guatemala. Por favor, un aplauso para Victoria. <risa> Crecer y resistir en medio del último ciclo de violencia por causa del conflicto armado en Guatemala para mí no fue fácil, especialmente en mi pueblo natal, el Quiché, el área noroccidental de Guatemala, eh, la cual, como muchos de ustedes eh, saben, fue una de las más afectadas por el conflicto armado interno. Eh, mi familia y yo fuimos víctimas de la paz eh, y siempre digo que también somos víctimas, eh, perdón, víctimas de la guerra y siempre eh, repito que somos víctimas de la paz. Eh, siempre que voy a, a, a un evento público, me gusta iniciar haciendo un homenaje a la vida de mi amado hermano José Méndez Dardón, quien fue asesinado en el 2007 durante el gobierno de Oscar Berche. Eh, Pepe tenía 28 años de edad y es una de las, más, eh, de las miles de víctimas que siguen muriendo en Guatemala en tiempos de paz. Eh, en mi generación... Somos varios que nos autodenominamos como hijos e hijas de guerra, hijos e hijos de la cultura del terror. Vivimos y recordamos la transición hacia la paz. En esta oportunidad eh, expondré mi apreciación acerca del después del juicio por genocidio y la importancia de transmitir la verdad histórica de lo ocurrido durante el conflicto armado interno en Guatemala y qué significó una sentencia con un sí hubo genocidio para nosotros los guatemaltecos y guatemaltecas. El juicio por genocidio tuvo implicaciones trascendentales para el país. No me refiero únicamente al impacto desde el punto de vista jurídico, sino al impacto histórico-político. Permitió que las víctimas en un proceso de sanación colectiva, como han mencionado anteriormente en, en el transcurso de estos días, eh, narran lo que había ocurrido. Implicó reconocer la verdad para iniciar el proceso de sanación de las heridas del pasado. Sin embargo, el juicio también evidenció que la estrategia conjunta entre el poder militar y el poder económico durante el conflicto armado interno en Guatemala cumplió con uno de sus mayores objetivos tácticos, que es controlar los grandes medios de comunicación social, distorsionar la verdad sobre el pasado y reprimir la producción del pensamiento crítico. Desde la judicialización del caso por genocidio y otros casos sobre crímenes contra los deberes de la humanidad cometidos en Guatemala, se abrió un debate sobre los hechos ocurridos durante el conflicto armado interno y los sujetos de la historia. Cierto grupo del conglomerado social, principalmente personas urbanas, de clase media, capitalinas, se dedicaron a repetir, no hubo genocidio. Negando el pasado y minimizando la magnitud de los hechos ocurridos con el popular hashtag, no hubo genocidio. De hecho, hubo hasta calcomanías que pegaban en los automóviles y la mitad de la ciudad capital en sus carros llevaban una calcomanía donde decía que no hubo negando el genocidio, los actos de genocidio. A pesar de todos los esfuerzos que hizo la Comisión para el Esclarecimiento Histórico, así como el informe de Guatemala, nunca más. Lamentablemente, eh, toda esta información no se pudo divulgar eh, masivamente y, y eh, la extrema derecha se encargó de catalogar todos estos informes eh, como informes que respondían a sesgos ideológicos de izquierda. Simplemente porque reconoce, recogen la verdad histórica que no le conviene a los sectores poderosos del país. De la misma manera, los acuerdos de paz nunca fueron asumidos como un verdadero pacto, eh, un compromiso eh, político real para reconstruir Guatemala con base a la verdad, la justicia, la reparación y las medidas de no repetición de todas las graves violaciones a los derechos humanos que cometió el ejército de Guatemala. Por lo tanto, la campaña estratégica de las élites para, para la negación de lo ocurrido y silenciar la historia surtió efecto. Como expone el doctor Edelberto Torres Rivas, él dice confundir reconciliación con amnistía es ignorancia o maldad. 
Poco importó la vida de mujeres, niños, niñas y ancianos indígenas del país ajenos a cualquier bando, es decir, población civil no combatiente. Importó más el debate sobre de qué manera la paz se ponía en riesgo y de cómo el juicio por genocidio estaba dividiendo al país. Eh, como he mencionado con varias de las personas que participan acá, todos evidentemente respondemos al, a nuestro contexto de tiempo, de donde nacimos, eh, de donde somos. ¿no? Eh, yo crecí en medio del miedo. Eh, mi casa fue refugio de muchos campesinos y campesinas del Consejo de Comunidades Étnicas, Runujel Hunam. Runujel Hunam en idioma quiché significa todos iguales. Recuerdo las amenazas, los exilios que nos costó tres veces fuera del país. Eh, aún puedo sentir el olor a fricción y el terror de pasar por la carretera de Santa Cruz del Quiché hacia la ciudad de Guatemala. Eh, una de las cosas que recuerdo son helicópteros de la zona militar número 20, que estaba cercano a Santa Cruz del Quiché, a las 3 de la mañana, y mi madre despertándonos a mis hermanos y a mí, que nos levantáramos a recoger los volantes que el ejército de Guatemala eh, tiraba en el pueblo de Santa Cruz del Quiché, amenazando a mi especialmente a, a mi papá y a nuestra familia. Me estoy saltando, pero aquí hay uno. Eh, Amnesty International en 1991 hace una petición hacia el Estado de Guatemala pidiendo que eh, protegieran a nuestra familia por todas estas graves amenazas. Y aquí hay una que Jaguar Justiciero, no sé si han escuchado de este grupo de terror dentro del ejército encargado de amenazar, pone a Milcar Méndez Urizar, la comandancia de Jaguar Justiciero ha sido informada que usted está participando con los apatrias de la URNG, que usted fue fundador del CUC y ser que tanta sangre han derramado en el pueblo de Guatemala, específicamente en el pueblo del Quiché. Como única advertencia, le informamos que tiene 10 días de vida, ya que su participación con el comunismo nos compromete a declararlo enemigo de la libertad y, en consecuencia, reo de muerte. Esas son parte de, la, de las experiencias que yo tuve como, como niña en mi infancia, crecer en medio del miedo. Eh, pero, regresando al tema que hoy me quiero centrar, que es el juicio por genocidio, en lo personal, a mí me impactó mucho ver ese debate de si hubo o no hubo genocidio y ver cómo eh, mujeres y amigos o compañeros de la universidad eh, se envolvían en esta ola para negar el genocidio. Entonces fue cuando me puse a analizar que efectivamente esa estrategia de las élites, esa campaña de las élites eh, para distorsionar eh, la verdad de lo ocurrido, estaba surtiendo efectos, ¿no? Eh, probablemente muchas personas no pueden leer conscientemente y reconocer la verdad de lo ocurrido, porque crecieron y vivieron lejos de ello, del dolor, del terror, de la muerte y del sufrimiento vivido por las comunidades indígenas, quienes se, obligaron, se vieron obligadas a soportar y resistir para existir. Pero eso solo lo explica, no lo justifica. ¿Por qué negar las graves violaciones a los derechos humanos? ¿Por qué apoyar que un niño o niña merecía morir violentamente por comunista? ¿Por qué no leemos, por comunista? ¿Por qué no leemos la crítica desde la crítica y una mirada más humana? ¿Apoyar que el ejército defendía a la patria? ¿De qué defendía el ejército? ¿De mujeres embarazadas, de ancianos? Eh, tengo una experiencia que compartir con, usted, con ustedes y es que justamente cuando se detiene al general de inteligencia militar, Manuel Callejas y Callejas, que estaba implicado en la desaparición forzada de Marco, Marco Antonio Molina, él fungía como director general de aduanas en 1990. Eh, no sé si ustedes, probablemente la mayoría han tenido la oportunidad de ver el reportaje fotográfico que hace Jean Marie Simon, eh, que en la primera edición fue en 1988, que se llama Guatemala, eterna tiranía, eterna primavera. El que está del lado izquierdo es la primera edición, que solo está en inglés, y luego ella ya lo edita eh, a español. Pero en 1990, Jean Marie envía desde Washington hacia, hacia la ciudad de Guatemala creo que 25 ejemplares de este libro, para que eh, mi padre, Amil Carméndez, y mi madre, Miriam Dardón, lo distribuyeran en el territorio del Quiché. Eh, el general Callejas y Callejas, eh, como él estaba en aduanas, eh, se da cuenta de lo que contenía el envío 
y e ellos desaparecen los libros, es decir, ellos no dejan que los libros ingresen eh, al país, porque era parte de su estrategia de que no se conociera la verdad de lo ocurrido. Ahora los libros se venden eh, libremente en Sofos, pero costó cuántos años eh, de ocultar a través de esta gran, eh, este gran trabajo periodístico que hizo eh, Jim Murray Simon. Eh, la historia oficial de Guatemala ha sido escrita por las manos opresoras. Con el juicio por genocidio, la historia del país empezó a escribir desde la voz de las víctimas y los sobrevivientes. La estrategia militar no tomó en cuenta que tarde o temprano las víctimas se fortalecerían, se vistieran de valentía para denunciar lo ocurrido. Además, tampoco tomaron en cuenta que hemos unos cuantos convencidos, algunos hijos e hijas de guerra, o simplemente otras y otras que no nos han robado la memoria y que estamos aquí por y para todas las víctimas. Brana, Heather Brana. I feel incredibly humbled and um, just uh, stunned to be in such remarkable company over the last several days. Um, I am so grateful to Victoria Sanford and Wolf Gruner for organizing this uh, remarkable gathering of people. And um, it's very meaningful to listen and learn so much um, from people who are focusing on this topic from so many different directions. So. Um, with my gratitude to all of you for hanging in and listening, um, for I think we're in the 22nd hour of um, genocide proceedings for the conference. Um, thank you for your attention. I'll try to be more interesting than your emails, and I'll also try to be um, at least half as interesting and heartfelt as my um, fellow panelists. So uh, I'm going to focus on the perspective of hijos this group that continues to appear in participant um, images and talk about a history of the idea of justicia, um, ultimately to explain what struck me as a, a really interesting response to, um, we've learned from Joe Marie, the vacation of the verdict um, on May 20th. So that's my preface and um, I'll go from there. So while many Guatemalans were shocked by the vacation of the verdict that had charged former President General Efraín Ríos Montt with genocide and crimes against humanity, young people from the group Hijos responded with the following affirmation. More than a failure, this can breathe life into our ongoing fight for justice. While at first this utterance might seem simply eccentric or insignificant, there was something very important in its articulation. They included with the new slogan, we do not forget we do not pardon, we do not reconcile. While earlier campaigns declared history as a right, this new slogan suggested an, an epistemological break with the terms of justice. For instance, the group's subsequent social media campaign uh, featured a barefoot boy who urinated into an army helmet. Uh, and you guys can read uh, the accompanying text, but I just wanna highlight the mention of the seed. They did not kill the seed. At the time, I'd been feeling frustrated uh, with the possibility that the Rios Mont case would dampen enthusiasm for pursuing other types of justice. So um, through friends of friends, I met um, Paulo René Estrada, member of Hijos. Many of you guys in the room, I'm sure, know him um, in the summer of 2014 through, like I said, some mutual friends. Um, as you guys know, the community of young social justice, human rights workers, academics in uh, Guatemala City is very small. Um, so I'd met some friends in the archive while doing dissertation research. And when I started asking about how they understood justicia, they said, you have to talk to Paolo. So we met, um, we had some very strong drinks and he let me um, record an interview. Uh, 
<laughs> which uh, records strong drinks. Um, also about how he became involved um, in this movement for historical memory. So I picked Paolo um, because I knew that while he was critical of courts-based justice movements, he was also seeking reparations um, for the loss of his father, Alto Rene, as a part of the Diari Militar case. So I started thinking historically about the idea of justicia um, actually before meeting Paolo. My research is about university student politics and social class making at USAC um, from the mid to late 20th century. I saw in this research many different expressions of justice, sometimes understood as a long process, sometimes something that people should take immediately into their own hands. Around the same time, I was reading people like Judith Butler and Wendy Brown on reparations. But most of all, I read Benjamin on violence and the purpose of the state in a democratic government. His, uh, for lack of a better word, inquietudes haunted me. And I began to think about how to research change in the uses of meanings of justicia in recent decades. So the idea is that faced with these apparently objective sums of death and loss and disappearance that seem to be able to be calculated and their debts thus paid, um, I wanted to propose and think along with these other people who I've cited a different version of justice um, that insisted on incalculability, the impossibility of calculating or counting. And as people have been talking about today, the immoral imperative uh, to remember and to remain provoked. Uh, I kept this list of people who I wanted to shout out to um, in the presentation whose ideas I felt particularly resonated with the ones I wanted to raise. And my list is so, so long that it would be um, just, it would take all of my time to read it. So um, if you hear your own thoughts echoed here, then I saw you and I heard you. Um, okay, so for me as an historian, um, whatever that means in this context, this call for different types of justicia from hijos had roots in decades of USAC students organizing and the changing relationship between students and the state, which is, of course, a central part of the global history of the 20th and 21st centuries, but which also has a distinct history in Huate. So I want to um, hopefully trace some of this history here briefly. So. On March 15th, 1945, newly elected president Juan Jose Arevalo addressed citizens from the congressional chambers. He said, we are going to equip humanity with the humanity. We are going to add justice and happiness to order. We are going to revalorize civically and legally all of the men of the Republic. Arevalo's inclusive we interpolated all citizens, workers, bureaucrats, students, campesinos into a nation built on just order. Arevalo, an educator, empowered San Carlistas, of course, to design a tax reform, new social security programs, um, to organize free clinics and workshops in the countryside. San Carlistas, of course, also served in the Constitutional Assembly and Congress and as ministers and advisors to the president. Um, so the mythology, right, is that San Carlistas were guardians of the national future and acolytes of knowledge. This was the meaning of justicia, humanity with order, order with happiness, and revolutionary guate from a certain perspective among urban intellectuals. But by 1952, conflicts over the precise meaning, oh, so behind, here we go. Uh, conflicts over the precise meaning of justice split civil society. For some, land redistribution, new primary schools, and the Social Security Institute, EGS, and other reforms had improved the quality of life. But poverty persisted, and university attendance, the marker of the middle class, let's say, remained out of reach for the majority of Guatemalans. So I'm always struck by the statistic, but by 1950, only 0.69% of the population um, over 18 had attended any university at all. That's 0.69, even though tuition was um, virtually free. So for some, social welfare programs and of course Arben's known ties to communism um, were unjust. One such group, whose plan de Tegucigalpa I've pictured here, is the, um, I don't know why I have the acronym in English, the Comité de Estudiantes Anticomunistas Universitarios. So the plan de Tegucigalpa called for Guatemalans to join the reign of truth, of justice, of work, for God, for the patria, and for freedom. So in this vision, justicia joins truth and work in opposition to the semi-holy trinity of God, patria, and freedom. Their champion, as you guys all know, Casio Armas, declared the defeat of communism the following year and then 
this document becomes the basis for the, uh, the counter-revolutionary government. Obviously, not all, all San Carlistas agreed. In 1956, the leadership of the university's largest student union, the IU, wrote, quote, some people believe archaically that the voices of the youth should not extend to condemn the methods of the government as the arbitrary actions that they are, but they forget that our philosophy, our art, our literature, and our politics present us with the inescapable need to make clear to them just who we are, and that is that our duty to sit face to face with freedom, with social justice, and with democracy. They affirmed that it was part of their essence and their duty in scare quotes, as students to speak out. So this was a meaning of justice advanced during the revolution, restored, in effect. The same group denounced the president's new constitution as traitorous for its, quote, violations of constitutional order, national sovereignty, and just governance. Okay. So I want to skip ahead a little bit. Um, but what's interesting is that just a few months after the statement that I just read um, is issued, Castillo Armas declares this state of alarm and limits, he does this to limit commemorations of the 1944 revolution. San Carlistas gather anyway, um, and four students are shot and 186 are arrested. The government accepted no responsibility for this act um, and then seized several copies, seized all of the copies of the famous student newspaper El Estudiante um, and confiscated the, the newspaper's treasury. So I said I wasn't going to read this, and now I am. Uh, the students, because it's so cool, the students um, from exile, effectively, in Honduras um, uh, issued something they called the final editorial. And what's interesting about this edition of the newspaper is that usually it's very well um, edited. It's very, let's see if I can show you. Yeah, it usually looks like this. Um, this particular edition had straight typewriter marks everywhere, and it was obviously kind of done um, on the run. And I think the desperation and the insistence in that moment um, is captured both in its form and then in its content. They wrote the editors in the final editorial, physically destroying a few dozen people, as the traitors have, will not destroy the opposition until soon pueblo de Guatemala. So if during the revolution, justice signified development, happy progress, and work led by San Carlistas, in the first years of the counter-revolution, justice came to mean something a little different. The promise of collective resistance in defense of individual lives, no longer protected by the sovereign state. Another key shift in San Carlistas' approach to justice was their invocation of human rights. So here's um, a cover of El Estudiante from 1958. And you see right there, um, the reprinting of um, Article 19 of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So every single edition of El Estudiante has this printed right below the title. And I think it's really interesting because at first, uh, this quotation to me seemed like a kind of confirmation of international law and principles of truth, freedom, God, and the nation. But as kidnappings, assassinations, and impunity increased across the 60s and 70s, to me, this quotation became less of an affirmation, more of a question, a demand. And of course, after May 1978, the massacre at Pansos, it was an accusation. So I'm going to shift and talk about that. One denunciation of the massacre declared that the ministries of education, finance, labor, the courts, and the army were under the sway of the oligarchy and of foreign powers. This was um, an atmosphere that the authors called, excuse me, um, fascistization. The negation of all rights universally recognized, such as the right to free association, the right to petition, the right to protest, and freedom of expression. The rising cost of electricity and telephone service, sugar, bread, public transportation, rent, and clothing were attempts to starve the people. The text continued, quote, faced with this growing struggle of the masses, the oligarchy and imperialism have now taken off their mask and unleashed a new wave of repression that at its most shameless manifestation in the genocide committed against the peasants of Pansos. Every large labor federation, the end, as you guys know, these were not uncontentious times among labor federations in the city, um, but every labor, large labor federation, the IU, USAC administration, and almost every single facultad, the secondary students' union, SIM, and teachers' guilds signed this manifesto. It described the deplorable state of things, 
but it also obliquely proposed several modes of justice. And um, we've talked about this over the last few days, but it seems to me to have been one of the first. Um, I'm skeptical to say the very first because I haven't read every single text and that's impossible, but maybe one of the first um, texts, certainly authored by students, to have named the government's mass killings genocide. Yet at the same time, it confirmed that Pansos was not the first, stating how hundreds of cases have simply been forgotten. That's a quote from the document. Urging historical consciousness, the manifesto observed that there could be no singular origin or definitive body count of genocide. Faced with the unknowable, the group called on the people of Guatemala to, quote, strengthen the Pueblo's social justice organizations, demand from the authorities the application of an agrarian policy that respects the rights of campesinos and distributes land to those who work it, join a huge united front against the high cost of living, and reject by all means the sale of our natural resources to the voraciousness of imperialism. The manifesto also called on the people to quote, demand that the authorities put an end to the repression and send those, so this is really interesting, those intellectually and physically responsible for the genocide at Pansos to the appropriate courts. So I, I think this demand is strategically two-faced. Given the condemnation on the one hand of government ministries, national businesses and the army as tools of the oligarchy, just a few lines above. The manifesto closes with a demand for, quote, exemplary punishment of those responsible for the genocides, plural, at Pansos. The use of the plural of genocide invoked the historical consciousness of justice. Formally, it was important to the ongoing struggle of, not for justice, to mark the event as a symptom of a new political order. Justice was not something to be attained, it lay in the struggle itself. So as early as 1978, students formed part of the Committee of Family Members of the Disappeared, a group that collected notifications from rural um, and urban poor um, communities about individuals who had been arrested, disappeared, or killed by fascist repression. The IU joined the University High Council to write a denunciation that listed the names of the students, campesinos, and workers who'd been assassinated between 78 and March 1980. To address a more global audience, San Carlistas once more altered the meanings of justice that had accrued over decades of struggle. And the structure of the CSU denunciation um, became standard in Guatemalan appeals for human rights and justice. It began with an account of the structural conditions of inequality that enabled repression, then, it affirmed the civic responsibility of the university. And finally, it indexed the kidnappings and assassinations and insisted that culpability follow the chain of command in the national police and army. The denunciation closed with a call for, quote, liberty or freedom, democracy, and national independence. So the UN responds to this. Um, it's the UN Commission on Human Rights, and they say, human rights are universal juridical guarantees that protect individuals and groups against actions and omissions that interfere with freedoms and fundamental rights and with human dignity. The government of Guatemala responds with various paid political advertisements that discredit the UN, including one, I love this very much, that reminded readers that the Cuban government was involved in the investigation. Um, so, you know what that means. Uh, Guatemalan citizens also got involved. Um, there is this anonymous editorial in La Nación that stated, uh, the moral here is that human rights exist only for the purpose of denunciation and intellectual use in politics, and that at the moment of truth, no force and no power respects them. Um, okay, so uh, I want to kind of move forward because there are other things I'd like to talk about more, but let me just summarize and say that then across the 80s and into the 90s, as you guys well know, in the city too, there's this pattern of protest, repression, denunciation that coheres. Um, at the university in 1992, policemen opened fire on a group of students leaving the annual Huelga de Dolores. Five students were injured and one was killed. And in this case, and this is very interesting, USAC administrators stood behind the students and remarkably, the agents were arrested and charged, though the case was never heard in court. Two years later, as the UN is sending a team to help negotiate these peace accords, a proposed transportation fare hike once more catalyzes mass protests in the capital city. And I'm sure some of you guys sitting here were there for those protests. 
as in 1978 and 1985, some San Carlistas joined people in the streets, um, erecting barricades and burning, uh, burning buses. The strike was a success, um, but a small group of students continued to protest and demand um, that the police um, treat their detained students better, other people who'd been detained in the moment. So um, the police try to dissolve these protests that are ongoing in the city. Um, they're unsuccessful, they ask for reinforcements, and then in, out of frustration, I guess, they open fire. Um, a student is gravely injured and left bleeding on the pavement while the police refuse entry um, to Red Cross workers. The student's name is Mario Aliotto Lopez Sanchez, and he died the following day. So taking advantage of international attention because of the peace accord, San Carlistas wrote paid political advertisements, uh, radio bulletins, and international press statements to draw attention to the killing. They use terms like human rights violations, political violence. Four high-level ministers and police chiefs are, um, are charged and imprisoned. Um, three of the four are released early, um, and so on. So it's yet another kind of failed moment alongside what, we, what will become this kind of um, celebrated success. The police accords, as everybody knows, were signed with some famous San Carlistas at the table. Um, and many of the students who'd been involved in struggles um, for social justice at the university graduate and take their positions um, in government ministries, uh, sometimes in NGOs, and, um, and life continues. In some sense, I guess, San Carlistas have come full circle. Um, to once more fill the ranks of the government's growing bureaucracy as they had during the 10-year spring. And some San Carlistas shaped the conditions of possibility for meanings of justicia across four generations. And I was just attempting across four generations of students to sketch some of that um, history of justicia. But what I really want to do is talk about this relationship with um, Paulo. So my argument's been that if in the 1940s, um, the idea arose that justice was a constitutional duty of young university students to lead the pueblo. By the 1950s, it had more to do um, with a contest over the meaning of democracy in the context of Cold War anti-communism. By the 60s and 70s, some students, sometimes in very close relationship um, to the indigenous pueblo, began to change their consciousness, uh, their conscience with regard to justicia, and through political funerals, attempted to make the death of a friend or a comrade or a classmate politically meaningful um, uh, for those who remained living so that they could constantly recall that life into public memory. So this is yet another articulation of justicia that's different from the others that I was outlining. It's also an understanding of justicia that's different from the CEH and the Remy reports. Each of these texts represents a project of critical importance, but at the same time, their accounting books of loss tend to reduce whole and complex students, in this case, to their deaths, and risk restricting more ample conceptions of justice that animated students during their own mortal life. So, transition here. So many slides I've missed. Here's one. I'll never be able to fix that. Here we go. Yes. It's important that you see that that's Mauro Calanquino's photograph. Oh, no. Now what? OK. This is what you really wanted to see anyway, the street art of hijos. So uh, I sketched this because I wanted to help contextualize some of these statements um, by hijos on Facebook and Blogspot as part of an ongoing fight not just for justice, but by justice. Also a fight over the meaning of justice. And I think we're in a particular moment when hijos could offer us a new interpretation. Again, a fight for and by justice, justice a venir. It seems to me that justice is not a single thing or a single moment, but a process that the pueblo has to seek, create, and continue to create. Now, when I ask Paulo about this, he seems sometimes enthusiastic and other times just very bored or tired or irritated um, that I'm taking a too academic approach to the question. But when we first spoke, uh, Paolo told me about his grandmother and how she told him once that the only adequate reparation would be if the state would buy her the home that her two sons would have built for her. Okay, 
So the family does receive monetary reparations, but she was making the point, obviously, that the house would have been built with care and with love for her as their mother. This is an affective register of loss um, that is simply impossible to make adequate um, in terms of accounts settled. By thinking and sometimes fighting with Paolo, I've come to believe this new generation can tell us something about the limits of the category of genocide in contexts where historical fact-finding and reconciliation generates impunity. For one, Ijos uses new social media against historicity. Theorizing and enacting a politics of the seed, Ijos roots and branches reach beyond Guatemala, beyond international courts, beyond inter, uh, human rights organizations, and beyond extant scholarship on truth and reconciliation. They use Blogspot and Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, Vimeo, Instagram. Uh, and using these platforms, the group cultivates a translocal community of affect. Paolo himself is featured on a seven minute video on YouTube, which you can watch, where he talks about how the government succeeded in sowing fear among his family members. Yeah? <laughs> because hardly anyone speaks about his father, except that he died for his ideas and for his desire to build a better world. This new grassroots praxis alters the terrain of genocide studies by proposing a new translocal frame for genocide, justice, and truth, including a counterculture of affect and memory politics against reconciliation. With some sort of justice in the courts, we are at risk of forgetting the more complex, broader understandings of justicia. And when we forget these forms, we do not only betray the visions of the future, so precious to those who lost their life in the struggle for freedom, but we restrict our field of vision such that we can begin to see the courts, trials, and verdicts as the final horizon of justice. So, uh, so when I think about the themes of this conference, I can only think of one thing that the very definition of justice in which I'm most interested is one that is necessarily social and ongoing, an ongoing fight for justice, a process that needs, that demands, that we do not forget, we do not pardon, we do not reconcile. Ijos gives us a reason to believe in an ongoing fight for justice in the public sphere. I'm taken by the fecundity of Ijos memories of resistance, a seed that germinates in the memory of resistance. Thanks. Thank you, Heather. Uh, now, please uh, welcome uh, Miguel Zamora Mills. Uh, he will be speaking about resisting impunity, preserving truth, victim participation, the querellante adhesivo, and the Rios Montreal. Um, yeah. uh, thank you, I'm Miguel Zamora. Um, it's a, a great privilege and honor to be here. Um, I must echo everything that Heather said as well, that it's been, for many, many years, I've read most of the, the academics that are here at this conference, and so it's, uh, it's intimidating to be with everyone. Uh, a quick uh, note before I start my presentation, um, the feature. The, the poster that uh, Heather had on her last slide um, is actually from a band as well called Rebeldias, which is a, a hip-hop band uh, of Chicanos in, in, from Chicago uh, who were involved with Hijos and did a really cool exchange. And so I also invite everyone to check out their music. And they have a song particularly about genocidio in Guatemala. Um, and on that note, since we also have the concert by Rebecca Lane later tonight, uh, another place where genocidio has been featured in hip hop music in, in youth culture is in um, Calle Tres's song that many of you have probably heard, El Aguante. Um, so, um, I'm not a scholar, I'm an academic. Um, my relation to this conference really came from the call for papers that came out and I was really struck by the opportunity and sort of the this first opportunity of this, that this conference presents as an international, uh, large international venue by a prominent uh, organization to really examine and, and um, 
and, and shed light on the Guatemalan genocide in a way that hasn't been that hasn't been in, in international space. Uh, these conversations have been going on for years and years in Guatemala and in other smaller spaces around the world. But to have something so big, um, I, I felt that was very important. And I was also struck by the name of the conference, um, the idea of resistance and genocide, um, and that's where I got the name from for this paper. Um, because it seemed to me like a very important opportunity to uh, tell t that I could uh, use my opportunity of, of being able to write a paper and doing this investigation and being in the US to make a bridge between the victim participation in the trial, which I think um, has been so important. Uh, Freddie mentioned it on uh, the first, on Sunday evening. Rosalina has talked about it um, yesterday and Marvin uh, yesterday as well, that none of these cases, uh, none of the transitional justice cases can happen in Guatemala without uh, the strength of the victims pushing the cases onward. Uh, of course, there's a huge network of people and organizations that help them. Um, most of them are here, or many of them are here, uh, and none of them have been mentioned, but it's really the victims that push the, the, these cases forward. And so that's why I want to look at in the, in the Rios Mon trial, uh, specifically in the legal trial, that participation of the victims and how that made a difference. Um, and I'm going to skip, I think, some of my, my slides because I've been very fortunate to have two very good panelists, uh, fellow panelists on the board, and then um, the f preceding panel has covered almost everything uh, around the genocide case, and so I'll be able to focus really on that participation just itself. Um, so yeah, I think we already talked about this, sort of the, the scope of the genocide, of, of the conflict, the consequences. Um, I think it's also important to remember that in Guatemala up until 2011, 2012, uh, had very, vi and continues to have very, very high levels of impunity. Um, an official, um, the official figures that the Ministerio Público, the public prosecutor's office came out with, was that in Guatemala there was 98% of impunity for homicide in 2011. And so this is an incredibly unequal society and a society that's um, coming out of a conflict that has, a, has had historically a very weak justice system. And so how is it possible um, that you are able to have a successful genocide tr case tried? Um, and, and not just a successful genocide case, but the first case of genocide tried in national courts ever, um, which is very historic. Um, and so my, my, my question came exactly from that. So my hypothesis is that you really have to place that on the strength that the victims had in, pu in pushing for and in persevering with the case for the past uh, 15 years. And in Guatemala, there's also another thing that's very particular um, that international tribunals haven't had until recently and that the uh, common law system doesn't have either, which is this idea of the queriante de civil, which um, you can translate sort of as civil party, as a private prosecutor. Um, it is, well, we'll get to it later, but, it, but it's, it's this legal figure that allows for official victim participation in the legal case that I think has been really important to help the genocide case and many other uh, transitional justice cases reach uh, successful verdicts. Uh, so I want to look at what role did that play for, for the survivors um, and victims, and how did that participation help in their um, healing process? Um, a little note, I'll be m using interchangeably the terms uh, survivor, victim, and petitioner um, throughout my interviews and throughout my work in Guatemala. Um, I know many individuals have different preferences on how they like to be called. Uh, victim to really remember what had happened to them, survivors to really place that uh, emphasis on their ability to, to resist and, and persevere, and petitioners in more their active role currently to seek justice. Um, and then I had some sub-questions that we won't get into just because of time. Um, how did this participation uh, fit into a larger uh, idea of resisting impunity in Guatemala. Um, I don't think that it's just a coincidence that you have the genocide case uh, shortly after you have uh, this past year with um, close to a thousand public functionaries in Guatemala captured on, gen on uh, corruption charges. And then this year, at, again, uh, very emblematic 
transition just because it's like separate circle or like crayon pass, um, like uh, Molina Tyson. Um, and then I also wanted to get, and we won't talk about this either uh, today, sadly, but what did the visibility of victim participation in the genocide case particularly, how did that help contribute to the healing process of other victims or other survivors, um, of forces appearance, of other massacres uh, in Guatemala, of other uh, indigenous groups that aren't Ishil but also suffered genocide. Um, so this will all go, go by this, so um, really quickly. Uh, the genocide case, this specific one, how Roy had already mentioned, um, started off as a larger case, um, looking at five different regions in Guatemala, and then uh, was just, was narrowed down to look at just the Rio Smont period uh, and just the Ishil region. Um, it was presented first in 2001, 2013 is when we have the verdict, and then uh, shortly after it's been reversed and how Joe Marie had mentioned, it's currently still stalled. Um, an another, uh, I guess, inspiration or, or uh, framework that I used for thinking about this question was uh, the concept of transitional justice, and I took um, the quotes directly from, or, or uh, a quote directly from the UN Special Rapporteur for Transitional Justice, which says, uh, none of this, this meaning transitional justice, truth, justice, reparations, non-repetition, the, the rights that go along and the ideas that go along with transitional justice, um, can happen on the backs of victims with, uh, nothing of this can happen without meaningful participation uh, by victims. Prosecutions for their part can only serve as an actual justice measures if the victims and their families are effectively involved in the process. And I think that's obviously very true um, and that the figure of Akira Antayasibo was uh, crucial in that. Um, if we compare Guatemala to other international tribunals, it's by far the most participative. Um, um, more than anything, this, this last line where you see that victims can assert their own competing theories of liability, of criminal liability in the case. And so uh, a big difference from the common law system, the victims and survivors here are not only uh, participating in the trial in terms of reparations or, or to seek damages, but they can actually produce witnesses and, and take the actual criminal, uh, file the, the actual criminal charges and assert their own theories of why the party is, is liable for that criminal act and ask for um, a certain type of, of criminal um, sentence. And so they'd asked, in these cases, obviously, for the maximum sentence. And they can also decide how they want, which charges they want to bring. Um, and so this, this freedom to really shape the, the, the criminal proceedings is very unique and gives them much more control over how they want to bring the process than other, uh, other mechanisms that are more focused on just uh, letting victims either speak or act as witnesses or only seek the, the civil damage part uh, to seek monetary reparation. Um, so in Guatemala, Quarenta de was something relatively new as well. It has only existed since the, uh, since the, the end of the conflict in 1996. Before that, Guatemala had uh, an inquisitorial system and it switched to an accusatorial system. And it was also part of the, the justice reforms that went along with the peace process. And so this was something that came out of products with civil society. Um, many human rights advocates in, um, in these roundtables on, on justice uh, reform talked about the problems they had had under the previous system of not being able to uh, reach justice in, in for, for crimes. That the state obviously didn't have an interest in providing justice to them and that uh, there are often many um, it, public prosecutors would not want to bring cases forward for personal reasons, for fear. Um, you had a system that didn't work. And so by inserting this idea of the queriante civil, it would give uh, victims themselves the power to take the criminal prosecutions themselves and to push uh, the public prosecutors into actually doing their work. Um, yeah, and so it, it, was, it was conceived as this idea uh, to combat impunity as a resistance to impunity that had, that had existed before. 
and it was also very interesting, even though in the genocide case, um, the victims, the, the Asociación para Justicia y Reconciliación, the Association for Justice and Reconciliation, did use a lawyer to help represent them. In the law, there's no necessity of having a lawyer. There's a victim doesn't have to have a legal representation. They can go and represent themselves and, set, and take their own uh, theories of criminal liability in the courts, which is very interesting. So it also is an access um, for those people who can't pay for a lawyer, uh, which you, we can imagine in Guatemala is maybe the majority of victims, especially if we're thinking about the, the armed conflict. And so it's really opening up the justice system to allow for victims to become the protagonists in their own cases. Um, so among the, the rights that they have, Kerian uh, Tecibo, as, as set forth in the um, the, the civil, uh, the criminal procedural code. Um, they can do their own investigation of the crime. They can receive the inv evidence from the public prosecutor. They can look through the evidence. They can analyze the evidence. They can um, present new evidence. They can present their own witnesses. Um, they can, like I, we've talked about, or have I mentioned, they can uh, assert their own theories of liability and they can participate in every single uh, phase of the process on equal footing to the public prosecutor. Um, and so I don't have that much time left, it, it looks like sadly. But uh, what I really want to focus on is in the, the AJOTER, because this is the organization of the victims and survivors that brought the genocide case forward, that are still bringing it forward, and that have been involved in, in many other cases. And so this is really important. Um, it's an organization of 22 communities, uh, over 250 members, and they have a different series of, of participation you can have. And so um, they, have, they may have survivors, family members, supporters, and you have people that are full members of the Jotera, because it's a legally constituted organization. Um, you have apoyantes or, or supporters of the organization. You have afiliados, that is, are people in the communities that help and are involved with the activities. Um, and it's, it's a very uh, well organized and, and wide reaching um, organization. They're from five regions in eight different indigenous groups, uh, all Mayan groups in, in Guatemala. And this is also important because um, many, many of the members, um, especially elderly and especially women, uh, don't speak Spanish and they only speak their language. But the Ajotoere has, has been able to keep an, a level of organization, uh, a very high level of organization, to communicate between all their, their different linguistic groups and really come to uh, uh, consensus together on how they want to bring forward or take different, uh, make different decisions in how to bring the case forward um, through the different organizations they have. And so in the Asamblea General and the General Assembly, they'll all come together They'll, they'll bust everybody in from all the regions and discuss what's been going on in the case, what decisions need to be made. And this is their highest uh, decision-making body. And so uh, when the decision came to present the case, they had the Asamblea General. They decided, they, they talked about what the risk would be, um, what the benefits would be, how much work it would be, the time that it could uh, take, and how if they wanted to go forward with it. Um, when the decision, the moment came to take the very big decision to narrow the case from the five regions to only the Ishil region, uh, this was a very big decision in the Assembly General, and they decided that f it was important enough to have a viable case to go forward, and it was better to go have, put one case forward that focused only on one region, one ethnic group, but with the idea that this was still not, uh, th this was still the, the AJR's case, not just the AGR Ishil's case, but the, as a full organization, and that they would all support it, and they would all be involved. Um, and actually, at the time of the genocide trial, their legal representative, uh, which is a single person at the time who was elected for a two-year period, was not Ishil, uh, which is very interesting, um, but was there representing the organization in the Ishil genocide trial, uh, sitting face-to-face -face with uh, Rios Montt, with Mauricio, Lope, uh, Mauricio uh, Rory Sanchez, and, and, and with their lawyers at their side. Um, and then they have their board of their directors, which meets uh, once or twice a month. 
uh, and you have one representative from each region, and so this is sort of the, the functional body that makes decisions on um, a more continuous basis, where the Assemblée Générale meets maybe uh, twice a year, typically. Uh, when you got closer to the case, they started meeting much more frequently, um, once every six weeks, more or less, uh, because the decisions were much more important, and they really wanted to make sure that everyone was involved. Um, I, um, it, it's important, I think, also to, to look at the history of the Jotere, where they came from. And so um, most of them, uh, it, the Jotere was formed during the refugee return process. Many of them had been, uh, after they had suffered massacres or, or other, um, other attacks, they were able to escape. Some of them were internally displaced. Some of them were able to make it to Mexico, but they were and somehow displaced uh, in refugees. And in the return process, they come. Um, Caldeache uh, helps accompany them, as well as other organizations. Um, the precursor to Fafre is also working in the region, and, and they begin the process of exhuming the, the bodies. And as they have this process, the communities come together for the exhumations. Um, as F Freddie has shown us on, uh, yesterday um, in, in, his, in his talk, um, the very community-oriented process of exhuming the body together. And this really helps uh, cement some of these relationships between communities, because you had had uh, community members who had been separated in these, uh, during the time period. They had, uh, some had gone to Mexico, some were, went just into the mountain or, or were internally displaced. And when they come back for these exhumations, you have the communities coming back together to try and find their loved ones. And it helps create a sense of solidarity. Um, and once they start finding their bodies, there's a, a very, very strong sense that they need to seek uh, formal justice for, for these atrocities. And Caldeche really helps uh, bridge the different regions. And so they see that the same experience is going on in all the different areas where you have the exhumation processes and they decide they start having uh, inter-regional um, uh, meetings to to help with the, the healing process so p people can talk about what it feels like to have the body exhumed, what they want to do w with uh, their loved ones, how they want to go forward seeking justice. And it's from these uh, inter-regional meetings that they decide that they're going to form their own organization, and they form the Jotere. Uh, and so when we talk about the participation, uh, we're talking about lots of different things. And so the Jotere um, presented the case. They found their own lawyer. They presented the case. Caldeche accompanies them. Um, later on in 2005, Caldeche also becomes a queriante adhesivo because uh, a queriante adhesivo can be a person uh, a victim, a family member of a victim, uh, in a human rights organization. And in these cases um, of gross human rights violations, the Constitution itself actually says that any person or any organization can bring charges against the government uh, if the government has, or a government official, um, if that if official has uh, participated in human rights violations. And so Caldeache becomes a queriante de civil. Ajotera is a queriante civil, and uh, the AJR has its own uh, lawyer at the same time. And so through the lawyer, they're represented in the tribunals, in, in the courts. Um, and it's incredibly important. Edgar Perez has been their, their lawyer since the very beginning, and uh, just an, an incredible jurist, an incredibly strong person. But behind Edgar, you have the Ajotera that really helps him with a lot of the work. And so the first part was identifying witnesses. And so they, uh, a large part of looking at the witnesses was going through the Remy, going through the, the, the CEH, um, and looking at who had been interviewed to go back and see what, what already exists. But the, the AGR, being uh, close to over 200, between 200 and 300 members, they knew, they were witnesses, and they knew who else had been in which massacres at what time, who had seen what, who had escaped. And so they go back and they uh, talk amongst themselves who, who feels confident, who feels uh, safe and, and really wants to become a witness, uh, step forward. And they go and seek out in different places that they need particular testimony from a specific massacre who can come and give that. And they talk to them about the process, why it's important to seek justice um, and about their, their organization. And that's how they start bringing in more members and, and they grow. 
Um, they also collaborate in the search for evidence um, in the regions. They collaborate um, also in deciding how they want to present the evidence. Um, this is especially important with the women and, and, sexual, and sexual violence. Um, and it was very important that at the moment that the first capture for the genocide process occurred in 2011, that the president, the, the legal representative of the organization at that moment was a woman. Um, and she asserted very forcefully in the legal means they would have each week with the lawyers in Caldeache um, that it was very important to, to underscore and, uh, and to show what had happened to the women um, in the Isho region and, and uh, in general during the genocide in Guatemala. Um, and lastly, of course, they also were involved in deciding um, what type of repar reparations they wanted. Estoy en cero. Maybe I'll just, if, if you don't mind, I'll leave up some of these slides uh, as we go to, to questions because it would take too long to go through them all. Um, but this was the most important part is the interviews I did, um, uh, 30 interviews with members of the, of the AJR um, about their, how they felt their participation was, what they thought about the, the sentence, what they thought about the de facto annulment of the sentence um, and what they are looking for going forward. Um, so I'll leave these up and I'll see if maybe I can weave some of them into to questions. Thank you. Wow. Gracias. Gracias a Heather. Gracias a Ana María a Miguel. Uh, tiempo, el tiempo, 20 minutos, no hace justicia indudablemente para lo que se tiene que presentar. Eso es algo que siempre los que presentamos tenemos problemas. Quisiéramos seguir pero vamos a tener la oportunidad de platicar un poco más en el proceso de, de preguntas y respuestas. Uh, yo quisiera, eh, una de mis investigaciones es relacionada con la forma de gobernar las comunidades indígenas en El Salvador, Guatemala y, y Honduras. Uh, y siempre les preguntaba a ellos, a las comunidades eh, cómo organizar, ahora que tú traes el, eso de organizar eh, a las comunidades con una estructura bien definida, que es, eh, es, es necesaria para entender que tienes un presidente, un tesorero, que eh, toda una estructura bien definida. Y me decía uh, eh, uno de los hermanos que estaba ahí, el problema es que nosotros este tipo de estructura orgánica no nos sirve a nosotros porque no es a la que estamos acostumbrados, porque es una estructura del, del mundo occidental la cual siempre toma ventaja de, de esa, ellos la pueden entender bien, pero es muy difícil impulsarla. Uh, y los organismos internacionales de leyes humanitarios utilizan esa forma, incluso eh, las uh, formas de derechos humanos que tenemos, que vienen de la Revolución Francesa, eh, y todas las, eh, las nuevas categorías que se van inventando no corresponden a las realidades de las comunidades indígenas que pues, están tratando de ver cuál es la problemática. Yo quisiera una pregunta en general para empezar la discusión es si este tipo de andamiaje legal que no ha servido para nada en absoluto a partir de la llegada de los españoles a Centroamérica, en este caso específico a Guatemala, es todavía viable a pesar de que eh, la estructura, eh, cuando decimos que Ríos Mon o los culpables se van a ir a arresto domiciliario con, cuando ya sabemos que ya tienen 80 años, ya de 80 años ya uno ya no le gusta salir, quiere estar en su casa. Entonces, ¿cuál es el punto del arresto domiciliario? ¿Se van a morir? ¿Y qué va a pasar? Yo quisiera saber 
si, qué tipo de resistencia es viable si la, el sistema añejo eh, permite soluciones y si, y, si, y si ya no, qué es lo que esperamos. Y la construcción de la memoria, la memoria para quién, en el caso de hijos, para la clase ladina, para el grupo ladino. Tal vez empecemos la conversación por ahí. Todos. Bueno, eh, entonces para empezar, bueno, tal vez para resumir un poco lo que iba a haber en, lo, en los cuatro, en, en los cuatro pantallas de, de, de voces, pero voy justo a eso, sí, no te preocupes. Eh, hay, hay cuatro grandes tendencias. Unos eh, reacciones de que realmente eso fue eh, bueno, porque por supuesto fue motivado para buscar justicia para sus familias y por eso participan, y que, que es un, una obligación que ellos tienen eh, eh, con, para la reivindicación de, de la memoria de sus seres queridos. Otro es este, eh, un poco de lo que, que hablas, una confusión de emociones, de, de tristeza, de alegría y de... Eh, de miedo y, y, y aprensión un poco so, alrededor del caso, después del caso también y, y con, con la sentencia y después el, el, la, el retiro de la sentencia. Eh, y otro es eh, que un alivio que se está quitando eh, el miedo, que han logrado realmente sentar en la manquilla al dictador, a, a Ríos Montt. Eh, unos me dijeron que, que nosotros que no somos nada, hemos eh, puesto a, a, a un presidente en la cárcel eh, no, y que les habían dicho que jamás iban a poder lograr eso. Y lo último es un poco eh, esa idea de resistir y que todavía tienen que eh, llevar la lucha adelante contra la impunidad. Y ahí yo creo que eh, tu pregunta, el primer parte de tu pregunta era interesante y es muy importante porque dicen, eh, pero Ríos Monta ahora está detenido, pero está en su casa, eh, come bien, eh, duerme bien. Eh, nosotros jamás olvidaremos lo que aguantamos, el hambre, el frío en la montaña, que solo éramos campesinos y que nos quemaron la ropa en nuestras casas. Y entonces hay esa, esa frustración que aún pasando por la justicia, que no logran realmente una justicia por lo que sufrieron. Y ahí yo creo que también, eh, bueno, y de ahí surge y les empieza a quitar un poco el miedo de solo... Eh, de solo pedir las reparaciones y reparación simbólica. En los primeros casos de Guatemala, eh, las víctimas siempre pidieron reparaciones simbólicas porque pensaban que era algo estratégico, porque si iban a pedir dinero, eh, no iban a querer darles dinero y que iba a ser más difícil, les iban a señalar que solo lo estaban haciendo para aprovechar y, y, y ganar. Entonces, la reparación simbólica eh, era algo que sí iban a lo lograr. Pero ahora le están quitando un poco ese miedo y sí tienen la idea que pueden exigir más, que sí tienen el derecho de, de mayores reparaciones. Y eso yo creo que, que es muy importante. Y que también, eh, como dijo Ana María, como nos mostró, había muchos ataques diciendo que esto era eh, un, un esfuerzo por parte de la guerrilla, los exguerrilleros de, de venganza. Eh, y entonces se tuvo que decir, no, esto no es venganza, solo es justicia, solo queremos justicia, eh, lo cual es cierto. Pero a la vez están empezando a ver, eh, o, 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 o no ver, porque ya se sabía, pero eh, eh, hay, hay muchos sobrevivientes ahora que le están quitando el miedo de ser señalados de también que venganza, pero de poder sentir que queremos justicia, justicia estamos, lo estamos haciendo por los pasos correctos dentro del sistema legal, pero a la vez tenemos el derecho de la rabia y de, y de querer un justicia, aun si sabemos que no, no se debe hacer así, de sentir adentro que sí un justicia mayor eh, eh, sí es necesario. Y ahí yo creo que va mucho a, a lo que hijos está tratando de hacer, donde dicen que ni olvido ni perdón, eh, que realmente... Eh, eh, si hablas con los de hijos, no tiene ningún miedo de decirles lo que ellos quisieran hacer a, a los militares. Eh, entonces, eh, yo creo que eh, sí, eh, esa pregunta va. Existen esas, esas dos eh, ideas y que no están en conflicto, pero que se llevan juntos. Ana María, ¿tú tienes algo que decir al respecto? ¿Más preguntas?
Gracias. Me interesó mucho tanto lo que dijo Douglas sobre cómo está dividida la comunidad guatemalteca, especialmente entre ladinos e indígenas, pero también me interesó mucho lo que dijo Ana María sobre cómo también está polarizada la sociedad, en la, especialmente en la capital. Y a mí me parece interesante también, hablando de crecer en la resistencia, um, como una inmigrante, yo soy del de Salvador, la forma en que se invisibiliza a la gente que se fue y, y su experiencia eh, de haber crecido y de haber vivido en una guerra, muchas veces queda borrado de los reportes, queda borrado de la historia, queda borrado del discurso sobre reparaciones, etc. Pero, um, pero una cosa constructiva que a mí me interesa mucho sobre la diáspora es la posibilidad que abre un poco fuera tal vez de las organizaciones más tradicionales que existen, de imaginarnos un país diferente, de, de establecer um, asociaciones que no, que no necesariamente estén divididas en esas mismas lógicas, de, separar, de, de desconstruir todo ese racismo con el que crecimos y en el caso del de Salvador todo ese clasismo también con el que crecimos. Entonces yo quería saber si... ¿Podrías hablar un poco de algunas de, de las oportunidades que tu propia diáspora abrió para comprender lo que había ocurrido cuando tú eras niña y estabas creciendo en este contexto que describías? Gracias. Pero me gustó muchísimo tu ponencia, el panel. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Eh, pues como comencé, eh, para mí fue muy difícil, pero a pesar de ese... Más bien le doy gracias a la vida de alguna manera de haber pasado ese sufrimiento, es contradictorio, pero es una manera eh, personal de iniciar un proceso de conciencia personal y un compromiso de hacer por los demás. Entonces yo creo que esa es una gran responsabilidad de los que, como dije, nos autodenominamos hijos e hijas de guerra, de transmitir eh, lo que vivimos. Eh, de transmitir nuestra experiencia y de ayudar y de ser la voz de muchas otras víctimas. Entonces, en mi caso eso fue, eh, yo estoy muy, muy agradecida con mis padres de, de haberme formado como una mujer con conciencia social, con una mujer comprometida eh, con mi pueblo y con mi patria, que como mencioné, sigue sufriendo y sigue llorando mucha sangre en tiempos de paz. Entonces, para mí ese es el reto y eso, eh, digamos, que es lo que... Más bien daría respuesta a tu pregunta de que es nuestro compromiso de seguir transmitiendo la verdad de lo que ocurrió en Guatemala para que no suceda nunca más. Gracias. is what is what are your thoughts on the system of private universities like Francisco Marroquin and private for-profit corporate television stations and the church the Pentecostal church as an institution that supports the ideology of Rio Simón as institutions to further genocide in Guatemala and how that system can be fought and combated. Your thoughts as a panel on those issues. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I think that there are um, obvious and material ways in which the private universities um, contributed to the undercutting of the combativeness of USAC and the isolation of USAC um, from the moment that they were permitted um, by the constitution um, and then in their proliferation. At the same time, I have known since then several uh, social justice warriors located at Landivar primarily um, who have done incredible things um, to attempt to uh, cultivate justice in Guatemala. Um, 
that's, I guess that's what I'll say on that. Um, it's tricky. Uh, also, um, c conscious of the presence of several notorious San Carlistas in the room, I don't want to just, you know, be another person who's like, ah, San Carlos. Um, but I, I am susceptible to that. Um, because um, one challenge in dedicating just a decade of one's academic life to researching a place is that you fall a little bit in love with the topic. Um, and there's something about this history of San Carlistas in the state that I think is truly remarkable. I came to the topic because I wanted to understand a moment when I thought that students had changed the world. I was very naive. Um, and I thought I found it in 1944. And then I was confused by 54. So um, I think that it's, uh, <laughs> really uh, remain confused. So I think it's really uh, important to think about the historical legacies of these places, um, Usaka especially. I wanted to say something quickly um, about the earlier question um, from our chair about uh, the, you know, what do you do with the system of law? Do you just throw it out? Um, and, uh, and I think that from the perspective of hijos, Something that's interesting is the way in which their denunciation is a kind of dialectical call and response, denunciation, enunciation. I think that without um, a Western system of law, lots of the claims of hijos would fall flat. Um, these are people, some of whom are um, trained in the Facultad de Derecho at USAC, who uh, really believe um, in uh, what we might call a kind of lowercase l liberal um, system of rights. That's what we've all been talking about for days. Um, so, it, I mean, I guess it's an open question. If you throw out um, belief in this Western conception of the individual rights of man, then what tooth does derechos humanos have? Um, so I, I, exactly, yeah, so I don't. And I think that is the point that I'm trying to make, yeah. that we have, we always talk about human rights, and it has been at the center of everything of what we do in Central America to denounce that thing. But ultimately, uh, it, it is really helping. Uh, and well, we know that's that. That's good that you are addressing that. And we know that Lemkin himself, and this is in David Kazanchin's essay, Reflection, does a terrible job of distinguishing between um, the value of derechos humanos and then Europe's and Lemkin's own uh, inability to see European complicity in the destruction of indigenous communities. That's a problem um, in Lincoln's own understanding of derechos humanos, yeah. Okay, uh, more <laughs> questions? Oh, okay. um, going also back to the, the, the universities, the, um, the private media, and, and the, ch uh, the, ch uh, the Pentecostal church. Um, I think there, there are two things. One, you think about how they reacted to the Nunatai case and the public discussion about uh, if uh, the publication on genocide in Guatemala and that they obviously came out very strongly uh, in the campaign that Ana Maria uh, showed us uh, against it with, with the idea that que no hubo genocidio. Um, the, the dean of the International Relations Department at the Francisco Maro King, very, very vocal that there wasn't any, um, mm -hmm. who, he also happens to be a commentator on one of the main uh, TV networks and they also have um, uh, a, pr a newspaper that they're able to give out free every day, so it also has a very large circulation in in the city. Um, and so you have that that is perpetuating uh, that violation of, of rights and, and that uh, perpetuating that impunity, which obviously has a very strong impact on uh, on society in general. Uh, for every, anyone who who uh, who does understand that there w was genocide, and even more so for victims and, 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 and survivors and family members of victims um, to have to, uh, to, have to s suffer and have, and have to receive that type of discourse uh, on such a, a blatant daily basis. And on, on the other hand, I think uh, a comment that Roddy had made in, in the last uh, panel and something that Rosalina had alluded to yesterday, um, there's also the sense that the genocide is continuing. Um, and and that genocide is very different. The idea is that uh, maybe the actions are a little bit different, or, or different, because you don't have the same scale of physical repression, but you still have um, the the encroachment on uh, the territory of indigenous communities, forced eviction, um, 
the a sense of that their rights are being that their rights are being violated uh, for not being consulted on different development projects, and that uh, sacred areas are being encroached upon, uh, dug up, destroyed, and so you do have that per perpetuation that is also very tied to the ideas that the Francisco Marroquin uh, purports of a very 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 uh, strong neoliberalism from the Austrian school. Um, and then also, of course, uh, the media, uh, the, the mass media uh, in Guatemala, which is uh, concentrated in maybe three principal uh, uh, companies, and that has a very, very strong interest in the extractive sector. Uh, gracias. Uh, tenemos más preguntas. Muy impresionado por esta visión de la, de la nueva generación de universitarios, no solo guatemaltecos, sino norteamericanos también, de todos lados, que preocupados por la situación en Guatemala. Me eslabono, me, me, me vinculo a la pregunta del, del profesor. Estamos cumpliendo, no, no exactamente estamos cumpliendo, pero se cumplen 60 años de que Castillo Armas, el Coronel Carlos Castillo Armas hizo una gira en noviembre de 1956, durante la cual las universidades de Columbia, de Forham y de Houston le otorgaron doctores, doctorados honoris causa. Cuando a Rómulo Betancourt, Rómulo, Rómulo, el escritor Rómulo Gallego se enteró de que el mismo doctorado que Columbia le había dado a él dos años antes, se lo estaban dando a Castillo Armas, él le devolvió simbólicamente el doctorado a Columbia. Es el momento en que como un gesto de reparación simbólica hacia el pueblo, a la sociedad, al estudiantado universitario guatemalteco, se le retiren esos doctorados que se le otorgaron a Carlos Castillo Armas y donde empieza la, la destrucción de nuestro país a partir de 1954 y que se establezca un programa de investigadores visitantes guatemaltecos a las universidades de los Estados Unidos. Necesitamos un consorcio interuniversitario, el Ivy League norteamericano, está, está asumiendo Guatemala nuevamente, estamos en esta universidad prominente, distinguida, generosa, y es el momento que entonces, que, que como parte de esa reparación simbólica, como parte para que no sea la marroquina, Miguel decía hace un rato, es uno de los, lugar, de los primeros lugares en el planeta o casi el único en donde hay, en el, en el campus hay el busto de, de Von Mises, el busto de Friedrich Hayek. Entonces, como parte de, de que las cosas vayan más allá del perdón que Clinton fue a dar o, o, o pidió, que la cosa venga más en concreto. John Hopkins se está resistiendo a que el caso de los guatemaltecos deliberadamente infectados por sífilis, que se tape cuando la profesora... Susan Reverie, apenas ahorita en un journal recientemente, aparece decir, las infecciones en Tuskegee dieron lugar a documentales, dieron lugar a investigaciones, a, 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 a acciones institucionales para que la población afroamericana y el resto de la sociedad norteamericana no, no olvidara esa infamia. Entonces, al mismo tiempo que están los, tribunal, los tribunales de Nuremberg operando, en Guatemala están una, con el... El, el consorcio universitario farmacéutico está infectando deliberadamente a, a la población. Entonces, eh, no estaría mal, yo convoco, ya lo habíamos hablado con Miguel hace algunas horas, con Ana, con los guatemaltecos que venimos, yo lo propuse en Chicago en, 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 en el año 2001, lo propuse en Miami eh, algunos años después y ahora lo propongo aquí. ¿verdad? Miguel eh, sugería también que como en vista de que se cumplen 20 años de los acuerdos de paz en Guatemala, pues no estaría mal ¿verdad? que pues, los académicos que querramos firmar o que querramos uh, uh, adherirnos a esa querella, eh, pues de repente podemos obtener eh, algo que nos sirva para seguir reconstruyendo nuestro país. Gracias. Uh, voy, a, voy a tomar, nos quedan... Unos cuantos minutos todavía voy a tomar la señora Tuyuk este, y agradecerle su comentario anteriormente. Uh, yo creo que ella habló sobre los niños. 
Y uh, yo trabajo con una organización aquí donde, eh, que ayuda a los niños que vienen de Centroamérica. Y es, es, es bien claro cómo incluso en el sistema legal aquí eh, discrimina. Uh, a los niños mayas no se les da ayuda, no hay grants para apoyar a que tengan abogados ellos. Eso es un nivel a, a, en todos lados. Y por eso es que mi cuestionamiento hacia el sistema legal que no está funcionando ni, ni las instituciones anteriores como sean el Ivy League y todo eso nos han hundido más. Señora. Bueno, eh, es comentario también, eh, como en algunas intervenciones eh, o comentarios que se dio, eh, un poco la idea de la frustración. Pero eh, yo quiero decir que si bien es cierto hay una frustración, pero como dije en mi intervención también cuando yo eh, decía que aunque el proceso fue anulado por, otro, por, por otra corte, pero para las víctimas quedó el precedente de que sí es posible juzgar el genocidio cuando eh, hay personas comprometidas también con la historia y con el genocidio. Entonces, yo creo que eh, hay, hay procesos legales que obviamente siempre va a costar mucho llevarlo porque principalmente las víctimas no cuentan con abogados. Entonces, eh, hay, eh, para llevar un proceso hay que pedir ahí sí que favor a otros equipos jurídicos a que lleven estos procesos. Entonces, eh, creo que eh, sí es bueno eh, eh, ver esa otra parte de la necesidad de, de seguir con los procesos legales. Pero también quería eh, hablar con respecto a, al papel de los estudiantes. Yo creo que, eh, bueno, principalmente los estudiantes de la Universidad de San Carlos también fueron castigados duramente eh, con, su, con los equipos también eh, eh, principalmente de catedráticos, que muchos de ellos forman parte de la lista de desaparecidos y de la lista de asesinados y otros que se fueron al exilio. Entonces, pero para nosotros fue un, eh, un levantar eh, lo que sucedió en el 2015, cuando los estudiantes de la USAC, de la URL, eh, de la Marroquín y, y creo que algunos otros de otras universidades que lograron juntarse como una fuerza eh, junto al movimiento campesino, el, el, lo, los pueblos indígenas, las autoridades indígenas, que no se haya visualizado la lucha de los pueblos indígenas es ese papel siempre los medios de comunicación, porque nosotros estuvimos tapando calles, tapando carreteras y, y bueno, eh, para demandar, pues, eh, digamos, eh, eh, justicia eh, contra, contra el genocida de Otto Pérez Molina. Entonces, Creo que eh, a raíz de ese mo mo movimiento, yo creo que faltó mucho también, quizá pues el, el que mayor cosechó la ganancia, pues es <ríe> de nuevo este presidente que tenemos, eh, eh, pues sin plan de gobierno, como decíamos, pero que el trabajo fue muy importante del estudiantado. O sea, al ver eh, una universidad realmente, eh, eh, porque no es que sean las autoridades, sino fueron los estudiantes que jalaron al Consejo Superior para estar al frente del trabajo. Entonces, yo creo que, y recuerdo porque sí tenemos mucha comunicación con los estudiantes de la, eh, de la AEU, eh, eh, 
de los conscientes, porque hay otros también vendidos, como pasa en cualquier espacio. Entonces, creo que es muy importante resaltar ese trabajo histórico también que logró eh, finalmente meter a la cárcel eh, a, a Otto Pérez, porque yo creo que si no hubiese sido ese movimiento social organizado espontáneamente, yo creo que eh, no hubiera podido lograrse lo que se ha logrado, aunque esté la CICIG, aunque esté el Ministerio Público, pero sin un movimiento social como se dio en, eh, en el 2015, yo creo que no, no tuviéramos en la cárcel a todo, eh, que creo que al final hay como 100 eh, 100 pues implicados en toda la corrupción y cabal eh, no se puede tal vez juzgar a Otto Pérez Molina por genocida, pero por, por ladrón está en la cárcel. Muchas gracias. <risa> Tenemos espacio para un par de preguntas más. Eh, Haz la pregunta y, y también vamos a tomar la de él para que ellos la contesten. Sí, mira, yo solo quería hacer énfasis que fue un triunfo histórico. Y quiero felicitar a los jóvenes que, que fue ese triunfo histórico de las mujeres mayas. Ellas jugaron un papel determinante en esto. Y esa es la historia. Después de más de 420 años hubo un triunfo histórico y se debe a ellas y se debe a, a la gallardía y a los deseos de que en Guatemala un día haya justicia realmente. Y tenemos que preguntarnos, ¿podrá haber otro genocidio? Gracias. Bueno, muchas gracias a, lo, a los penalistas. Eh. Igual que los que han expresado antes, es, es muy bonito ver a las nuevas generaciones estar en paneles como estos, ¿verdad? los, los eh, futuros políticos, espero, de Guatemala, una, una clase política más honesta, ¿verdad? o honesta de verdad, porque la que tenemos está muy corrompida. Eh, pero bueno, hoy una de las cosas que yo quiero abordar en, este, en, en esto es que es muy esperanzador ver los cambios que están ocurriendo en, en el Ministerio Público ¿verdad? en los últimos años, especialmente con las últimas dos fiscales eh, pero, y también dentro del sistema de justicia. Una de las cosas que a mí me llaman la atención es ver eh, el número de jueces que asumen o que este tipo de casos. Y me llama la atención que básicamente son los mismos jueces los que toman estos casos de alto impacto, como les dicen, ¿verdad? Mi pregunta es, ¿hay más jueces o son los, los mismos que, que hemos visto en la televisión? ¿Hay más jueces que podamos decir, bueno… Si Galvez ya no está, ¿verdad? Si ya no están los otros jueces que, que tomaron el caso Gerardi, por ejemplo, eh, habrán jueces que también tendrán el valor y la honestidad de, de tomar estos casos. Y lo otro es cómo cambiar los mecanismos de elección de la Corte Suprema de Justicia y de la Corte de Constitucionalidad, que muchas veces son los que obstruyen los casos también, ¿verdad? Que los votan al final y al cabo, como pasó en el caso del genocidio, cuando tenemos una corte de constitucionalidad eh, corrupta, por decirlo, ¿verdad? Como pasó anteriormente, hace algunos años, en el caso de Ríos Montt, que la corte de constitucionalidad se le antoja decir, bueno, Ríos Montt sí tiene la capacidad de participar en las elecciones, cuando todas las cortes de constitucionalidad habían dicho que no y las posteriores dicen que no, pero hay una que dice que sí y le permite participar en las elecciones. Y a estos, ¿verdad?, se les ocurre decir que no, ¿verdad?, y votan el caso por genocidio. Entonces, ¿hay mecanismos, hay posibilidad de cambiar eso, eh, 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 esos, esos mecanismos de elección? ¿Y hay otros jueces? Yo creo que al hacer un balance, eh, en un equilibrio ¿no? de, los, de los avances eh, que ha tenido Guatemala en la reforma al sistema de justicia, justamente es la ley de comisiones de postulación. 
eh, con la llegada de la Comisión Internacional contra la Impunidad, eh, la CICIG, en Guatemala, eh, de alguna manera se impulsó eh, es la reforma a la ley de comisiones de postulación como un mecanismo para transparentar eh, y limitar la discrecionalidad de la selección de funcionarios de segundo cargo. Eh, especialmente para el Procurador de los Derechos Humanos, eh, magistrados y jueces. Evidentemente hace falta más, pero yo creo que es una buena herramienta y porque justamente también le da participación a la, a la ciudadanía para interponer cualquier objeción que tenga a, 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 los, pues, a, a las personas que nombran. Un, un resultado de ella es que Claudia Paz y Paz haya sido nombrada fiscal general de la República gracias a esta ley de comisiones de postulación. Con el caso de genocidio y los casos ligados a, al conflicto armado interno, el problema, digamos, es que es la, por competencia son los tribunales de alto riesgo y la estructura organizativa del organismo judicial no, valga la redundancia, no se ha organizado de manera de descentralizar en estos tribunales, que prácticamente son tres, si no esté mal, alguien me va a corregir, son tres. Entonces, eh, yo creo que no, justamente eso, que hay que seguir eh, trabajando y como ciudadanos vigilantes a que la ley de comisiones de postulación se cumpla y gracias al apoyo de la CICI, que siempre ha estado así, y de la, de la sociedad civil en general, que gracias a esta ley eh, se ha hecho eh, un estudio de cada candidato y se han hecho objeciones válidas y en tiempo sobre los funcionarios que están postulando para un puesto en el sistema de justicia. Voy a llegar a tu pregunta yendo por los comentarios de Rosalinda, porque estoy totalmente de acuerdo con, con lo que ella resaltó, que según mi, mi evaluación y las entrevistas que hice con la JTR, eh, que eran muy bonitas porque ya gozaba de mucha confianza con ellos, porque viví un poco más de un año eh, en el Archimishik y trabajaba con la JTR y les acompañé en el proceso como, como se mencionó antes. Y yo creo que definitivamente el resultado de, del caso era esperanza. Eh, hay frustraciones, hay cosas que, que, que quisieran que se mejora, eh, varios ob obstáculos, pero eso es esperanza, es esperanzador. Y, y es también lo que dijo eh, Joe Marie, que realmente... Eh, ellos ven a la sentencia, y como dijo Rosalina, ven a la, a la sentencia como válida, porque fue, porque no fue rebatida eh, por la CC. Y la CC no anuló la sentencia, no tomó la sentencia y, y dijo que esa sentencia no valía. Eh, simplemente, como explicó muy bien, eh, retrocedió el, el proceso y, 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 y por eso de facto se, se anuló. Y esa esperanza yo creo nos lleva a cambios muy eh, importantes en el sistema de justicia. Entonces, tenemos esa gran esperanza. Eh, los élites bien, ven que, que Guatemala está cambiando, que ellos no mandan totalmente, que ya el sistema de justicia no está corrompido al 100%, que sí se puede lograr eh, meter a alguien de, con mucho poder eh, en la cárcel por los crímenes que ha cometido. Y justo por eso, como habían mencionado también el, el panel anterior, eh, se saca a Claudia Paz y Paz antes que termina, culmina su, su periodo. Y se llama a eh, nuevas comisiones de postulación para la nueva fiscal general, que eh, salió muy bien, eh, eh, fue, que fue de mucha suerte. Pero ese proceso en 2014 relevó que realmente hay, aún esas comisiones están mal, están muy mal, están muy corrompidas. Y va también a, a la pregunta anterior de, del profesor, que las unidades privadas juegan un papel eh, importantísimo en las comisiones de postulación, que todas las universidades que tienen facultad de derecho tienen, pueden poner su decano en esas comisiones para elegir quién va a ser el, el próximo fiscal general, que va a ser magistrado de la Corte Suprema, eh, quién va a ser de cortes de apelaciones y creyó un, un sistema de negociación político que ha sido muy, muy malo. Entonces, esos, ese proceso logró, ese último proceso en 2014, se logró realmente relevar eso. Y a partir de eso, eh, un caso muy particular de una jueza eh, que se llama Claudia Escobar, eh, se realmente eh, se miró con mucha, mucha prueba el, el tráfico de influencias que se estaba dando. 
Y a raíz de eso se empieza, se abre más espacio para la CICIG también de hacer más investigaciones y eso realmente eh, les ayuda, eh, les, les da el espacio eh, social y, y, y las primeras indicaciones para eh, todas las investigaciones que, que se presentó el año pasado. Eh, un enorme eh, logro para el sistema de justicia de Guatemala eh, o para cualquier sistema de justicia en el mundo realmente. Y lo que produjo es, eh, los eventos del año pasado es que ahorita, este, bueno, hace eh, dos semanas, acabó un periodo de un proceso de, de cuatro meses de discusiones en el interior, en la capital, eh, de sociedad civil, sector privado, el Estado, la academia, el colegio de, de abogados sobre una reforma constitucional a la, al sistema de justicia, de cómo se van a elegir los, los jueces y magistrados, qué eh, calificaciones, qué requisitos eh, tienen que gozar, eh, tienen que tener, eh, y cuáles van a ser sus funciones. Se habla también de eh, un, un pluralismo legal, de reconocer al sistema legal eh, indígena y maya. Eh, entonces, todo eso da mucha esperanza para el sistema de justicia en Guatemala. Y también lo que ha relevado es esos procesos desde, desde la sentencia por genocidio hasta ahora, es mostrar que sí hay, eh, si bien hay, hay unos eh, autoridades de justicia emblemáticos y, y realmente eh, increíbles, detrás de ellos también hay muchos más. Y, y el ejemplo que ellos ponen, o que ellas, porque la mayoría son mujeres, eh, da confianza a, a los demás trabajadores del sistema de justicia que también quisieran hacer su trabajo de una forma eh, buena y ética. Y entonces se ha creado también nuevas asociaciones de jueces, eh, nuevos eh, líderes fiscales también, eh, abogados, grupos de abogados. Entonces, eh, sí. uh, muchísimas gracias a un aplauso para todos ustedes, en primer lugar, por hacer posible esta, este evento, esta conferencia, a los panelistas, a Victoria Sanford por poner mucho esfuerzo en esto, a Show Foundation, y a, al, al pueblo guatemalteco que nos sigue dando lecciones día a día de cómo hacer eh, muchas cosas y estar resistiéndose. Muchísimas gracias y seguimos adelante. Yeah, thanks uh, so much, uh, all the panelists and the chair. Uh, we reconvene uh, tomorrow uh, in a different uh, location, not here at USC, but at Pacific Palisades. Um, and uh, I should make the announcement that there is Uh, still food left from the lunch, so whoever feels hungry after such a lot of food for thought uh, but uh, needs some other food, then there is uh, food uh, available uh, next door. So thanks all for coming and uh, see you all tomorrow. <laughs>